All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Cain, and I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for February 9th, 2012. So this week, we're going to be talking about uh, the methods of, proposed methods of interstellar communications, uh, a supermassive black hole eating asteroids, the a, a skydive from space, well, stratospheric skydive, uh, the Russians reaching Lake Vostok and what they found, uh, and the evidence that Mars once had an ancient ocean in its northern hemisphere. All right, and again, I am shared by, uh, by my space comrades uh, in arms. We've got, uh, we've got Alan Boyle from MSNBC's Cosmic Log, Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society's Planetary Society blog, uh, Ian O'Neill from Discovery, uh, we've got Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today, and Pamela Gay from Astronomy Cast, Star Strider, CosmoQuest, many hats she wears. So I realize, you know, I've, I, I always say Pamela's got a doctor, but actually there's a whole pile of doctors here, right? Ian, you're a doctor, aren't you? Yep, there we go, Dr. Ian O'Neill. In, in the sun. In the sun, yeah. In the sun. In the solar, solar astronomy, so. Uh, and Phil is a doctor as well. Um, okay, well anyway, so <laughs> let's get started. So first this week, we're going to start with, uh, with Ian, and you're going to talk about a, an article that you guys posted to Discovery Space News this week about uh, proposed methods of interstellar communications. Yeah, um, well, we've been running a series of uh, these um, articles on interstellar uh, travel, and it's been uh, produced, all these articles in the series have been produced by the uh, Icarus Interstellar Inc., and they are basically a non-profit group of scientists who are doing a very cool thing and designing a mission to another star. Now, they build on work of the British Interplanetary Interstellar Society, I think it was, uh, from the 70s. And they worked on a project called Project Daedalus. So Project Icarus is the son of Daedalus, um, as, the, as the mythology goes. Um, so this is like an updated version, and basically it's all based on current technology. So this isn't like sci-fi stuff. I mean, it is the, the concept of interstellar travel it is kind of science fiction-y at the moment. But they're trying to apply current understanding of technology to an interstellar probe. Now, this isn't like the 100-year Starship project, although there are a lot of crossovers. And in fact, um, Icarus Interstellar is one of the contenders for the prize of the 100-year Starship project, which is a DARPA joint DARPA and NASA um, endeavor to design a mission to another star. Um, but I believe the 100-year starship is based on a human mission. Now, uh, Icarus and Stella, they're really focusing on a five-year study into um, a, an unmanned mission, so it's basically a probe to another star. Now, we had um, the most recent, um, uh, we've had like 20 articles. I mean, we've been blessed with all this input from, from the group for all, all these different scientists within, within Icarus. And uh, recently, as only this week, um, Pat Galea, he's a um, software engineer and communications expert from the UK. And he's just discussing something very basic. You know, how would we, if we sent a probe to another star, how in the hell would we communicate the thing? Because using current technology, and the only technology we actually know at the moment is that communication is only going to travel at the speed of light. So we can't expect something faster than speed of light. There's nothing, there's no tachyons flying around that we can communicate with in, in our Star Trek universe. So basically he looks at the problem of communication. And to cut a long story short, he kind of goes through, you know, radio communications, laser communications, all the pros and cons of that. And it's really weird, actually, this week, another bit of news that came up, actually from Hubble, and it touches on gravitational lensing. Now, with Hubble, you often see this, um, you, you see these wonderful images of um, a galaxy, and then around the edges, you see these, these strange shapes, these like arcs surrounding the galaxy. And basically, these arcs are images of galaxies behind the foreground, gal uh, foreground galaxy. So it's almost acting like a, a lens, basically looking into deep space, and the gravitational um, distortion of the galaxy in the foreground is pulling the light around it and amplifying the light from behind. So the Hubble group, they've done a really interesting study, and they've actually pulled apart this, this, this lensed galaxy from behind and then put it together and actually unskewed it and actually seen what it looks like in, you know, the, at, at from, from Hubble's point of view. Now, going back to the interstellar project, 
um, Pat actually discusses the possibility of using the sun as a gravitational lens to boost a signal from an interstellar probe. So say if we sent a probe to Alpha Centauri, which is over four, four light years away, I mean, obviously, the communications will, st will still travel the speed of light. But over that vast distance, you need to somehow amplify the signal because it's going to be lost in inter interstellar space. So basically, his argument is, and the argument, and in fact, this, I think this was actually brought up um, uh, before by the um, British inter Interstellar Society, and they'd um, envisage having a beacon which would be situated like 500 AU from the sun, um, and basically it'll be opposite the sun to the interstellar probe and the signal from the probe would come and it'll be spread out by the time it hits the hits the gravitational pull of the sun and the sun would lend the signal to this receiver so that's really, really cool. mind stuff basically and the nuts and bolts of it is are very complicated but I just thought that was a an amazing concept and the articles online so you can get all the details there that is really, really cool. It's weird. Um, it's, as you said, you know, I mean, a lot of these technologies are all possible, but feel like science fiction for sure. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and this is the thing. I mean, uh, interstellar um, travel isn't necessarily impossible. And, you know, to use the word impossible to any scientist is, is bad because ultimately we've got, you know, good imaginations and we can think and we can put two and two together and we come up with science fiction ideas and then find the physics behind how these things could possibly work in the real world. And that's basically what Icarus and Stella are doing. And uh, there's, there's many other groups out there that work on this problem, but just because we've received some of our articles, I know what they do. Um, but yeah, this concept of using the, the sun as an amplifier for the signal, I thought was pretty cool. That's really smart, yeah. yeah. All right, why don't we move on? So, uh, so Nancy, you're going to talk about a story this week about uh, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way consuming, is it asteroids? Yeah, basically the, uh, the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way eats the asteroids for breakfast and burps out X-ray gas. So that's kind of a mashup of the, uh, the different headlines I've seen. And let me uh, share some images with you here. All right, you guys yeah. see that? Okay. Well, uh, what's what's been going on is uh, for the past couple of years, or past several years anyway, um, scientists from Chandra have been seeing kind of X-ray flashes coming from the black hole at the center of our galaxy, which, uh, as you know, is also known as Sagittarius A star. And uh, they were re really kind of perplexed at at what this was, and and finally. Um, they kind of came up with a, uh, a scenario of what was happening because you know it was happening actually pretty frequently, sometimes uh, up to three times a day. And let me show you a video of uh, of uh, that they created. Sorry, this is new technology here. We're trying to uh, to see if we can uh, put in uh, videos and, and images while we do this. Okay, this is not the right one, <laughs> but it works. Oh, there we go. You've seen that. And remember, you want to widen it. Okay. That one, yeah. There we go. Okay. So anyway, uh, this is what they were seeing uh, with the Chandra telescope. And they kind of came up with uh, the following scenario that uh, an asteroid would undergo a close encounter with uh, another object like a star or planet and be thrown uh, in its orbit towards the, the, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And if an asteroid would pass within about 100 million miles of the black hole, um, then it would be torn into pieces by the tidal forces from the black hole. And then the fragments would be vaporized as they, uh, as they pass through the, the thin gas throwing into the black hole. And uh, kind of similar to how a meteor heating up uh, as it goes through our atmosphere would be uh, kind of disintegrated. And then a flare would be produced as the remains of the asteroid are kind of swallowed up by the black hole. So pretty crazy. Um, here's our article about it. And uh, anyway, uh, you know, there's been some kind of disagreement in the past whether there were that many asteroids around the, uh, the, the center of our galaxy, around the black hole, if they could actually exist there. Um, but the, the scientists said that they did a kind of a reality check and they did work out that a, possibly a few trillion asteroids would have been uh, uh, removed by the black hole over the 10 billion lifetime of our galaxy. So they, uh, 
they think that it's possible. So anyway, uh, it would, they're going to be looking some more with Chandra over the next, uh, uh, next while and uh, seeing if this is actually a reality of what could would really be taking place. That's really cool. Um, and I guess the, the more energy, we've seen energetic, I mean, it, we talked about this before, Pamela, I think, we've seen energetic blasts coming out of supermassive black holes before, right? In, you know, when they're actively right. feeding. And, and so we're not always sure what's causing all of these different reactions, but we, we see a variety of different active and inactive black holes periodically burp out these high energy events. Um, with our own Milky Way, we can actually trace out the edges of bubbles formed by events in the past. And there is a case around 2002 where we thought that the Milky Way, um, that its supermassive black hole might have actually eaten the planet in the past based on the amount of x-rays that we're seeing echoing. Um, it, it's just awesome that we're starting to be able to say in real time, oh, it ate an asteroid. Um, so all the pieces are coming together showing that the theories that we had were actually right, made good predictions, and now we can watch things being consumed. That's cool. right. Yeah, and, and they did say that, you know, it probably not just asteroids, but also comets and possibly a planet, because like Pamela said, they did see one really huge burst yeah. a while ago, and they thought maybe it's a planet. That's pretty crazy. But it's interesting that it can, they can detect it even to something as small as an asteroid, but I guess it's that, you know, the black hole really consumes them in such a high energy way that what we see is that blast of, of gamma radiation. So, so the, thing radiation. To rem the, the thing to remember is they're really taking mass and converting it to energy, and that whole E equals MC squared things means you can power New York City with a potato for a very long period of time. And so once you start converting even small amounts of mass into pure energy, um, it, it's kind of amazing just how much energy is locked up in the atoms and even your body. Yeah, okay. someone is talking about science fiction. Someone mentioned at one point there was a, a good way that you could actually uh, um, gather uh, energy, like a future civilization will gather energy by, by harvesting matter through a black yeah. hole. So they'll take, they'll take a black hole, they'll, I don't know how you would do it, hold it somewhere, and then feed it, and then the energy is going to pop back out, and then you harvest that energy, and it's the purest form of, of energy that you could harvest. All right, well, why don't we move on? Yeah. Um, so, Alan, you've got a crazy story this week, which is uh, a, uh, some person who's going to do the world's biggest uh, skydive. Holistic. Right. Wow, we're going from the sublime to the sometimes silly. Uh, the, you could look at this as a publicity stunt. It's been in the works for years. Uh, Red Bull has been trying to sponsor this project to send a person in the form of Austrian skydiver Felix Baumgartner up to a height of 120,000 feet and uh, he would go up on a helium balloon in a pressurized capsule, uh, step out of the capsule wearing a spacesuit, basically, and uh, jump uh, down to maybe a mile of altitude before he hits the parachute and comes down. And, and that sounds crazy. Why would anyone want to do that? Well, they've done it already before. Uh, in 1960, uh, there was an Air Force guy named Joe Kittinger who jumped from around 108,000 feet. And so this is an effort to break a record that stood for 52 years. And uh, it's, uh, the, the technology and the idea of doing this is, is intriguing. Uh, what's the point? Uh, well, it gets some publicity for an energy drink company. <laughs> it also adds uh, another point in the record books, and, and those are harder and harder to come by nowadays. But uh, people have talked about actually doing space diving. Now, uh, the important thing to stress is that 120,000 feet is not space. But uh, Rick Tumlinson uh, from uh, Space Frontier Foundation has been working on this for for quite a few years trying to work with Armadillo Aerospace to develop a system where you actually do go up into space and do the sort of thing that they did on the new Star Trek movie where you're, where you're diving down and then at just the right time you hit your safety system and, and come down safely to Earth. It, it's, it would be the ultimate rush and, and another thing for rich people to spend their money on when it comes to space <laughs> tourism. Uh, but uh, So we'll see. Uh, a lot of the technology for this could have an application to developing uh, the sorts of spacesuits that uh, space tourists and, and, 
and adventurers and daredevils uh, might wear in future years. And so uh, it's, it's, a new, uh, it's a new sort of uh, high adventure, uh, frontier type amusement that, uh, that might have some application to spaceflight in future years. Well, an interesting thing is that one of the people who's involved in this team, besides Kittinger, who is still around at the age of 82 or so, is uh, Jonathan Clark, who is a NASA flight surgeon whose uh, wife was killed in the Columbia tragedy. And so he's done a lot of research into what it's going to take for this next generation of private space travelers to do their thing. And so I, I think that when you get beyond the publicity value of it, there, there are some things that could be learned from, from this sort of exercise. And it's going to make a heck of a TV, uh, a reality TV show, which the BBC is working on. So stay tuned for that. Could be sometime this year. Uh, there were some reports that they were going to do this in August, but uh, the folks who are organizing this event say they haven't nailed that down, but they're aiming at sometime this year. They were going to do it in 2010, but uh, they had a legal issue. One of the promoters said that uh, he you know, held the rights to this sort of event. So it took a year or so to work out the legalities. They reached an out-of-court settlement, and now it's back on the agenda. <laughs> And that's my story. <laughs> that's amazing. I and, and don't forget, Doctor Who did this at Christmas. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, everything, Doctor Who has just done everything. I mean, let's face it. Sonic Screwdriver, you know, uh, he's, he's already been there, done that. Of course, if you could travel in time, you know, it's easy to do. I can, and then you can imagine sort of the next step is they're going to put on those wingsuits, you know, and yeah. they're going to be jumping from space, and they're going oh, to be, you bet. they're going to be, you know, Oh, yeah, no way ever would I do that. <laughs> All right. All right, so Pamela, why don't we move on? So uh, you've got a story for us about I do. Uh, Russian scientists cracking into Lake Vostok. And, yes, so um, it was discovered back in 1996 that underneath Vostok Station, there is the largest um, underglacier lake in Antarctica. It actually turns out that trapped beneath several of the different glaciers and ice sheets are these giant lakes, probably freshwater lakes, that are kept liquid, kept warm by the massive pressure of the ice sheet above them and by heat from geothermal thermal sources underneath them rising up. Lake Vostok is the largest, and since 1996, the, the then Soviets, well I guess no, then it was Russians still, so then Russians, still Russians, have been slowly working to dig their way down through the ice. They took a pause for a number of years um, because there was significant international concern that their methods might not be the safest. Um, not so much unsafe for the planet, unsafe for the Russians, but unsafe for anything living in the lake because what they were doing was boring down and filling their borehole with a combination of kerosene and freon. And there was concern that this um, not exactly good for life material would get into the lake that is believed to have been sealed off 14 million years ago. And any life that could be in that lake is, is life that predates anything on the surface of the planet and is unlike anything on the surface of the planet. The lake is a, an extremely oxygenated environment. Um, it's completely dark. And if there's life in it, it's the type of life that we can hope to eventually find perhaps on the moon Europa. So there was this long many year pause to try and figure out how do you tap into the lake, take water samples, and do it in a way that protects the lake's environment. And, and while America and several other concern, countries continue to have some concern, they developed new ways. Uh, they developed heat drills to make it the last several meters down. And just a few days ago, um, they were able to, to melt their way down such that the pressure from the lake beneath burst in, pushed up all of those nasty chemicals they had so that they had a small flood in the, in the station of, of kerosene and freon coming out at them. 
and the pressure of the lake pushed up and pushed up a sample of water so pure that they're saying it's more pure than twice distilled water is that, that you can normally get for laboratory situations. The, the Russians have collected 40 liters of this material. Um, they're taking it back. It will be studied. And what is amazing is they pulled this off just barely in time to catch the very last plane back from Antarctica before the season ended. So unfortunately, it is now turning towards winter in Antarctica. They had to abandon their borehole, having capped it with frozen ice. They'll have to redig their way the last bit in next season. But the plans they have for next season are kind of amazing and terrifying all at once if you're afraid of, of contamination. They're actually planning to take back a, a robotic probe, drop it the more than 3,000 meters down through the, the borehole, and explore the lake, taking perhaps sediment samples from the bottom of the lake using this little robotic um, explorer that they're hoping to send down in the future. So who knows what we're going to find. Hopefully, we haven't already killed them all with accidental contamination. But early ice samples, early ice cores taken showed hints of extremophiles, a life that is able to exist in extreme conditions down pretty much to the surface of the lake. So there's a lot of hope that life as we do not know it is going to be found down in Lake Bostock. I wonder if the purity of the ice or of the water that they pulled out gives some kind of indication on how much life is down there. You'd think that if there was life, you know, and then, then maybe they would be making the water less pure. But I, and I wonder, well, you know, what they have for a source of energy, right? So, so the source of energy actually isn't that much of a concern. The, the lake actually has a fairly significant magnetic anomaly on one end of it that is thought to be due to a thinning of the Earth's crust there. Um, so it, it's felt from this and other uh, data that there's geothermal uh, vents perhaps at the bottom of the lake or at least warmer air areas due to geothermal energy, the heat of the earth rising up and keeping the bottom of the lake warm. So it's thought that if there is life, it most likely clings to these vents. Now the purity of the water can come from a variety of different things. On one hand, it probably means it's not completely filled with the type of life that tends to take over things like fish tanks rather quickly. Um, but it's also due to the, well, there aren't all the chemical pollutants that we have in our atmosphere settling into the water. So it's a mix of it's chemically pure, just there isn't as much stuff down at the bottom of the ice, and perhaps if there is life, it's, it's clinging to the vents, and we're just seeing the surface water right now, and that's not where the energy is, so why would the life be there? Yeah, if, um, sorry, just a quick thought. What, wouldn't you say that if life wasn't discovered down there, say it was completely sterile, yeah. wouldn't that be um, just as significant a discovery than if there were extremophiles? It, it would, and it would actually be quite disappointing. They, they've, in the process of, of digging this borehole, they found some of the most amazing things. They found um, mutant shrimp 600 meters down. They found um, extremophiles embedded throughout a lot of the ice. And if we find that this 14 million year old trapped body of water is completely devoid of life, it tells us maybe life doesn't form as easily as we had hoped. Um, because all the things that are necessary for life are there. You have the thermal gradient, you have the heat source, you have a solvent water. Um, so if we don't find it, it, it means, well, maybe the probabilities of finding life in the briny water um, somewhat trapped on Mars is lower, and maybe Europa is a less reasonable place to continue going to. But we're not going to face that, not until we have evidence. We can keep dreaming. All right, and so for our, our last story this week, we're going to go to Emily Lakdawalla, and, uh, but of course, we want to see what craft project Emily Lakdawalla is working on this week, because we will have noticed she's been sort of gazing down. What have you got for us, Emily? Yeah, well, uh, the one that I've been working on this week is related to the story for this week, which is about um, some new evidence for the possible existence of oceans on ancient Mars. Um, and the reason I'm making a model is because it was found by a European spacecraft called Mars Express using an instrument that's not a camera, nor is it a spectrometer, nor a charged particle detector. Um, to, to explain to you what this instrument does, first I'll show you a I haven't finished the project, unfortunately, but I'll show you a square showing what the base of the spacecraft looks like. This is the size of the spacecraft. That's how big it is. 
And then I want to show you how large the instrument is that they used to detect it. Here's another face of the spacecraft. And I'm going to have to back up and back up and back up and back up to show you just how long the antenna is on this thing. It's a 40 meter dipole radio antenna that both transmits and receives. It's called MARSIS and it does subsurface sounding of, um, of, of Mars to look for layers of either rock or groundwater or ice that might be existing below the surface. If you think about it, most cameras and other such instruments are only seeing the topmost like uh, microns to maybe one millimeter of the surface. Um, even an instrument like a neutron spectrometer, which can detect subsurface hydrogen, only gets down to about half a meter. I have to back up again. Only gets down to about half, half a meter. And so having an instrument that's, ca that's capable of broadcasting wavelengths from a 40 meter long antenna means that you can see much deeper into the surface, hundreds of meters, maybe as much as 4,000 meters, depending on the material. Um, so anyway, they've been using this instrument to map the subsurface of Mars and they found some very interesting things about past glaciers and underneath the ice caps. Um, but what they found in the northern regions of Mars is, is different to what's been found with other instruments. Um, the neutron spectrometer that I mentioned is on Mars Odyssey and with that they detected near surface ground ice um, in a large ring around both poles on, on both sides of Mars. Um, in areas is where the atmospheric scientists say you can expect there to be ground ice on Mars year-round if you dig just a little bit below the surface. And the Phoenix lander actually proved that um, measurement to be correct because they landed in one of these regions where all you could see with your camera was dirt, but they dug down just a few centimeters and they near surface ground ice. Well, with the Marsis measurements, at the South Pole, they found the extent of um, what they think is water um, or water ice to, to match that same region where you have near surface ground ice and where the meteorologists say that it should be stable. But in the north it's quite a different story. They found a material that had the same radio properties as the near surface ground ice extended underneath basically the entire flat northern lowlands of Mars including way down even close to the equator under things like the Utopia Basin. And Utopia Basin and these other ones are significant because Mars has these vast outflow channels that all empty into these great basins like Utopia. And so the story is that what Marsis is seeing, which the neutron spectrometer on Mars Odyssey couldn't see, is ground ice that is buried much deeper. Um, and the possible story is that you had these outflows from Mars' southern highlands that filled um, an, an ocean in northern Mars. And then um, they created sediments that were absolutely saturated with water. That water may have frozen or it may even not have had a chance to freeze before some other deposits formed on top of it, things like dirt um, and, and other sediments. So you may actually have vast deposits of ground ice trapped underneath the Mars northern lowlands a few hundred meters down where none of the other instruments, except for the incredibly long antenna of Marsis, can actually detect it. So that's the story. That's really cool. And so obviously this is this chain, right, that we're searching for. You, you find evidence of past water on Mars, you find water, you know, ice on water, ice on Mars, then maybe there's a chance that there's there is either past life or even current life on Mars. Yeah, it, and it all has to do with habitable environments. And so one of the main questions about Mars's history, we know there's water on mice today, uh, water on mice. We know there's water on Mars today. Um, we know that it flowed through these great channels in the past, but we don't actually know whether Mars's climate would have allowed an ocean to exist for very long. Um, and if it existed, very, whether it was warm enough for it to be liquid at the surface or whether it was always mantled by, by ice, kind of a snowball Mars. Um, but it's very significant if we can show that there was an ocean existing in Mars and, Mars's northern lowlands for long enough um, to, to persist for a very long time, which would give life time to get started. And really, the, the, the hunt for watery environments on Mars has everything to do with time. How long did the water exist on Mars? And that's really the goal of what geologists are looking for right now.
And so do you think that Curiosity, when it arrives this year, is going to be able to provide any additional evidence on this? That's precisely what Curiosity is looking for. Curiosity is not a life detection mission. It's um, going to be going to Gale Crater to study a hugely thick package of sediments that should chronicle a large slice of Mars's history. And by investigating those sediments very closely, Curiosity will be able to figure out what the environment was like when those things were deposited. And it might say, well, at this one, there was water at the surface. On this one, we're only seeing evidence of groundwater, but in arid deposits, which is actually what Opportunity has seen a lot, is that most of the sediments the opportunity has seen were actually windblown sands that had groundwater percolating through them later, which is not exactly what we think of when we think of an environment that's conducive to the start of life, although, you know, we don't actually know how life can get started. That's the, that's the big asterisk on all of this. Um, but so Curiosities is going to be addressing exactly that question, although at a place where it will not encounter any actual ground ice, and that's very intentional, so as to avoid the kinds of problems that they've been talking about at Lake Vostok, which is uh, forward contamination of Mars with Earth life. We don't want to discover life on Mars and not know whether we brought it with us. Right. Uh, I, I had a couple of things I wanted to kind of pass by, Emily. One was the study that came out based on Phoenix data saying that Mars may have suffered a super drought and that kind of argues against the uh, possibility of habitability if you have a long stretch where there's, there's you know, not much water available. And another thing you mentioned, uh, where does life get its start? Well, uh, it might be that you've got this panspermia thing going on where, uh, where rocks are blown from Mars to Earth, we know that, and rocks could be blown from Earth to Mars, and so perhaps uh, wherever life arose, uh, it, if it gets a foothold someplace else, it, it could look a lot like uh, life on the planet next door. That's absolutely true, and, and so I think, and of course that's one of the things we were hoping to test with our Mars, uh, Phobos life, which is now either at the bottom of the ocean or somewhere on a mountain in Argentina. Um, but the, it, it's a very good question. We, we could possibly find life on Mars and find that it's based on DNA, um, and then we have to ask the question, did life start on Mars and get transported to Earth, and that's where Earth life got started? I, did, was there actually transport back and forth? So if we find life on Mars and it is based on DNA, then, then that's a question. Did we bring it with us? Did it exist there for a long time? And of course, um, using the same kinds of methods that we use to figure out how uh, modern um, life forms on Earth are related to each other, how long ago they had to diverge, we can maybe answer that question. If life on Mars is based on DNA, but none of the proteins have any similarity to the ones in Earth life now, then that would tell us that it, di that it diverged a, a very long time ago and that it could not have come with uh, whatever we sent to Mars in, the, in recent history. Oh, and regarding the Phoenix one, um, I'm, I, I actually haven't read the article. I, it, when I do, I will read it with some skepticism that one study can prove that all life on Mars is impossible, but uh, I'll have to look at that one. <laughs> I don't know if anyone noticed there's cool images of, uh, of Phoenix. I, Nancy, you posted this, right? There's some pictures of Phoenix again seen from space. So it's still, it's still there. got covered by ice and has been uh, revealed again. Um, all right, well, that's the sort of scheduled part of, uh, of ten today's episode. Uh, now, now, Emily, before we kind of move on to some questions, you have one quick announcement for next week, right? We're, you're, you're roping in a special guest for us? Yes, that's right. Uh, Alan Stern, who is the principal investigator for the New Horizons mission, was the associate administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, um, has agreed to come on next week. Um, hopefully it'll work out. And you guys uh, should prepare some good questions to ask him, because this is a guy who knows what's going on in NASA space science, and also with the mission to Pluto, and also with what's going on on the Kuiper Belt. So there's lots of different things you could ask him about. So even think about maybe sending us some questions ahead of time that we could ask him. Yeah, I mean, he worked on the Dawn mission um, and then New Horizons. So uh, in three years, when New Horizons arrives at Pluto, that's all anybody's going to be talking about. That's right. Alan, Absolutely. Alan, Alan Stern <laughs> is, the, uh, is, the, is the guy who sort of headed the, is heading the project. So it's a great chance to talk to somebody really influential in, in the space and science. And of course, uh, one of the reasons that he wants to talk is because he is campaigning to have New Horizons put on a postage stamp, a process that takes years to happen. He wants that postage stamp to be available when New Horizons is flying past Pluto. And he's got a change.org petition that you all ought to go out and sign so we can see that New Horizons postage stamp at that time. 
Yeah, and just in general, uh, you know, if there are other people, you know, in space and astronomy that you want us to talk to, you know, you can always suggest them to us, and we'll see if we can we can contact them. And it's you know, it's not that we don't know everybody; it's that nobody knows how to use Hangouts yet. So it's more like we serve as technical support <laughs> to help them get their camera ready and their microphone ready, and you know, help them figure out how to get access to it. So, but if there's people that you want us to bring in here, uh, we can definitely uh, reach out and, and start bringing in some special guests. So. Glad to do that. Well, now might be a good time to advertise. We're going to be do our first live interview hangout tomorrow, uh, Friday, with uh, rover driver Scott Maxwell. Which and is so, awesome. Um, yeah, it, it should be fun. That'll be at uh, 10 Pacific time, t uh, noon Central, 1 o'clock Eastern, and I believe that's uh, 1,800 hours. Yeah. 1,800 hours uh, UTC. So. You have yeah. to watch out. If you guys think I talk fast, wait till you hear Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've interviewed him before. It, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, and the Hopefully concept we can put a, a. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say the concept with this, right, is that we get to interview all kinds of people all the time for the stories that we're working on. But in many cases, we just talk to them on the phone. They answer, you know, they answer our questions, and then nothing ever comes of it. And so we thought, and there's many times when I've interviewed somebody, I'm like, I wish. I could have just recorded this. People could be a fly on the wall and, and listen to us talking about this. In fact, I had an interview with Alan Stern that I wished I could have saved in some format. So this is your chance. I mean, this is, you know, Nancy is actually working on an article and, you know, has, in, has invited Scott. And so you can just listen in while she does her interview in preparation for working on the article. And we're hoping that you'll find that interesting. So... That's going to be tomorrow, uh, as she said, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, 1800 UTC. And it'll, if you watch my stream, you'll probably that's probably the easy way to see it because I'll I'll have to run the, the hangout and then uh, I'll I guess I'll be the one showing the pictures while Nancy and, and Scott talk. So um, okay, great. Well, let's see if there's any interesting questions that were uh, have percolated while we've been talking. Um, and I know you all want like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm sure it's, it, the question's there. So if Neil deGrasse Tyson wants to get on Google+, Plus, he's welcome to join us. Um, uh, where was, there was a question here. Oh, people want your I want to believe poster, Pamela. The one you have in the background. So, so yeah, I, I am a long-term X-Files first few seasons, not the last few seasons <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> and I got that poster back in college, and, and I still have it. Um, I believe you can still get them at uh, posters.com. Um, Adrian asks, uh, he imagines that a good target for Icarus would be a, a near-brown dwarf. Does that, does that make sense as an interesting target for a space probe? I guess because they're close. Yeah, and the interesting thing is uh, um, why is the, the infrared mission um, is detecting these, these things all the time. And apparently there's way more brown dwarfs in our cosmic neighborhood than we ever, ever realized. So these uh, brown dwarfs, of course, are basically, they're, they're called failed stars. I call them overachieving planets because they're like <laughs> halfway between. They're like the bridge between the largest planets and the smallest stars. They, they can't sustain fusion in their cores but they got a lot of characteristics that make them like glowing infrared stars. So, so they're kind of a weird um, exotic object. And they emit a lot of um, infrared, so they are being detected by infrared missions. And there is this idea that perhaps they could act as stepping stones to the nearest star. So say if there are a lot more brown dwarfs in our cosmic neighborhood than we really, really do believe, it's like that we could be surrounded by them. Um, they could be used as staging posts for interstellar missions. So they could provide, you know, um, a nice, nice place for, a, you know, a, a, a fuel depot. I mean, I don't know how these uh, the future starships would mine their fuel, but perhaps it'd be a good place to pick up some hydrogen along the way if they've got a fusion drive. So yeah, they could act as stepping stones to the stars, which is quite a cool idea. That is really cool. Uh, so. Um, oh, uh, Dion Ness wants to know, what would happen to suns if they're eaten by those black holes? I mean, if we're seeing those kinds of blasts from just asteroids, what would we see if a star got eaten? Oh, Pamela's, uh, you're muted, Pamela. 
Yes, sorry. Um, it, it, you'd basically just see a bigger burst of high energy radiation coming out. So uh, Ian's hand gesture was entirely correct. Um, but what's neat is you'd get enough radiation coming off that it would push on the interstellar media. And so many, many hundreds of years later, you'd see pockets in the interstellar media from the radiation given off when the star got consumed. Now, is is that enough to make a quasar, or does it have to no. be more than a single star? It would have to eat a so lot of with stuff. So with a quasar, you actually have a continuous feeding process. So, so with a quasar, you have a lot of material, dust, gas, stars, planets, all getting driven in, and it forms a disk going around the supermassive black hole. And that disk, over a long period of time, falls into the black hole, and the disk itself gives off tremendous amounts of light. Stars falling in, that's just a snack. And, and so you get this single momentary burst of, of consider it a burp from the snack. Um, so this is the difference from, think of a quasar slowly sucking in a very long spaghetti noodle. Um, and, and eating the star is just pop it in, burp it out. Um, so this one's for Alan. Uh, Thad Zabo asked, uh, I guess wanted to know what it, what the implications of no atmosphere would be for doing a skydive from the stratosphere. I mean, right. Uh, actually, there's basically uh, no atmosphere at uh, 120,000 feet. You, after you get above uh, around Everest, or maybe even around Everest, you still need to be supplemented by oxygen. And so you're basically diving from space in terms of the oxygen uh, requirements. And so that's why Felix is going to be wearing this high-tech space suit. It's basically a pressure suit. He's got enough oxygen for uh, 20 minutes of breathing, which is uh, a good thing because it, this is supposed to last somewhere around 10 to 15 minutes, but uh, I would be still a little bit nervous if that's all the oxygen I had. Yeah. So uh, it, it'll yeah, that's be a nail a biter. Like but so that but does he not has sound no, like enough margin. Yeah. yeah, but he has no he has no atmosphere, so he has no way to kind of control his fall. So I mean, is there a risk that he could? spin out of control or, you know? That is a risk. That's what happened to Joe Kittinger is that he went into a spin and blacked out and didn't come to until uh, one of his parachutes automatically deployed at 10,000 feet. And so that's the thing that you do wow. have to watch out for. Uh, but uh, hopefully they've got that sort of safety uh, constraint built in in case that happens. You, you don't have as much maneuverability, but when you start hitting the atmosphere, uh, you have to really be a skilled s skydiver in, in order to control those aerodynamic forces. And so that's one of the reasons why they're going with Felix Baumgartner, who is one of the most uh, skilled and, and uh, most well-known skydivers that, that are out there. He, he sky jumped over the English Channel, for example, and over the highest building in the world. What, what's absolutely amazing to me is, is when we have spacecraft re-entering through the atmosphere, you're extremely worried about the angle of re-entry and having the spacecraft at just the right angle so that the heat doesn't overheat or, or you, you get enough drag that you come through at the right speed. And now we're talking about human beings controlling their body while experiencing the, oh my god, that's a planet down there. And, and pulling all these pieces together in such a way that using their muscles, they're recreating what spacecraft do. Well, except that the spacecraft are coming in at five to seven kilometers per second, right. and he's going to be starting with zero velocity. So right. that's your difference there in terms of atmospheric heating. But yeah. he is going to be going at, at supersonic speed oh, at right. some point. Uh, it'll be something like Mach 1.2, which is a slow, it's a lower speed miles per hour when you get up into the upper atmosphere. And, and we, we got asked when we ran the story, well, what about terminal velocity? And so he's so high up, the air is thin enough that you exceed what would normally be terminal velocity lower in the atmosphere. Wow. That's just terrifying. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, so Ian Dennison wanted to know a magnetic anomaly in uh, Lake Vostok. You know what that means, right? That's a UFO, right? No. No. <laughs> no. Um, so is there a big risk of, or I guess, could there be, and this, who's, someone asked the question, I don't want to steal their thunder here. Um, no, Ian, Ian also asked this. Could there be issues with the drilling that there could be bacteria that could actually survive in the kerosene and contaminate the lake if it got in? 
Um, it, it's not so much bacteria surviving in the kerosene that's worried about um, as the kerosene getting in and bacteria on the drilling equipment. So the, the final bit, they actually were using heat in the final bit to heat through. So you can imagine this is the equivalent of using the hair dryer so you're not touching the ice. But they still had to get very, very close with drilling equipment. They still have equipment down there. So it's a matter of what got carried down on the metals that went into, I'm just trying to cling to life on the metals. Kerosene and Freon are fairly good at killing things. So it's, it's unsterile equipment or contamination by deadly chemicals. Pick one. Um, so uh, back to the Mars story. So Jonas Kidane wanted to know, uh, is there any conclusive evidence or where are we at with the methane discovery that was detected in the Mars atmosphere? Yeah, I've heard an awful lot of doubt about that one recently because the, um, most of the methane detections from Earth are at levels lower than the amount that they have to correct for in Earth's atmosphere. So there's a lot of, of doubt about that. Um, as far as the Mars detections, what we really need is a trace gas orbiter that can figure, that can map these things more closely. Unfortunately, Yinghuo-1 would have been the first spacecraft to actually be able to do that measurement, but NASA is now building a spacecraft called MAVEN that, is, that will be able to make that detection later. Um, also, uh, uh, Curiosity is going to be able to make very careful measurements on the methane in Mars's atmosphere where, at the site where it is and um, actually do isotopic ratio studies and that sort of thing, to, which can help you know, differentiate among different hypotheses for its origin. Um, one more question here, I think. Uh, I guess Ian wants to know again, are there any plans for missions to Europa and, and or Titan? Well, it depends on what you mean by plans. Um, there's certainly a lot of PowerPoint presentations written by a lot of scientists, um, especially on Europa. Pe they have been working, I mean, Europa is, is I think, uh, unless you talk to the Titan advocates, I think Europa is pretty much agreed upon to be the, the place where we really ought to send a flagship mission next. Um, and, uh, and the reason that I don't think they should do Titan next is because we're not done studying Titan with Cassini yet. But it's been, it's just been impossible to get this mission started. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it's all about the money, um, as it usually is. And uh, just in the, when you look at the budget and the out years, you can get studies started. You can throw a couple tens of millions of dollars at it and, and get blueprints to start being uh, drawn up. But, but so far, there has not been the money, which basically means not the political will to get this started. And of course, political will originates with the people. So um, as I am not really a journalist, I work for a uh, nonprofit organization that advocates space research and exploration. I'm going to tell you again to go talk to your congressman and say, we want more money on NASA, please, because um, it will uh, lead us to discoveries, possibly looking for life on Europa. And also, the spin-off technology ain't bad. There is a um, presentation, actually a 200-page document that came out of NASA this week showing you just in 2000. 2011, what NASA, um, what has spun off from NASA developed technologies, and it's it's a lot of stuff. I had a question about uh, ExoMars. That uh, there's been a lot of talk about what uh, the next NASA budget is going to do or not do for the Mars missions that the European Space Agency has been planning. And so I wanted to find out from the other folks uh, what they thought, whether this was going to be the end of Mars exploration, like Robert Zubrin says, or whether there's a little more hope. So la last year at the Lunar Planetary Sciences um, conference, the NASA town hall was one where there was a lot of, seriously, seriously, we're doing that, um, related to Mars because the missions that are planned are, are ones that are a bit terrifying to think about because it requires landing two spacecraft side by side. And if you look at how we normally land spacecraft, there's this large landing ellipse and you say the spacecraft will be somewhere in this ellipse. And the idea of, of being able to actually land side by side is a bit scary. But the current plan is um, we're going to continue our support for the joint U.S. Uh, uh, European Mars missions. We are going to continue to plan to have these side-by-side -side spacecraft, one of which returns rocks from Mars. Um, but that was the plan going out of last year's budget 
budget crisis and as we enter a new budget and a new budget crisis it's even a little bit more extreme. Um, I, I suspect we're going to be hearing a lot more in March at this year's Lunar and Planetary Sciences meeting. Um, the NASA town hall meetings is when we find out which of our dreams are being supported and crushed. Um, we're not going to get Europa back. We're not going to get Titan back. We could lose Mars. Um, but I guess the good news is that NASA is continuing to at least support the mid-level missions no matter what. So I'll we'll just find mention out. that Monday is going to be when the budget is announced, and so there will be more about uh, NASA's proposed budget uh, that we'll be hearing about on Monday. That's something to watch. And, yeah, uh, and the head, on of the, the, the head of the European um, Space Agency Science um, uh, Department or whatever, um, he came forward and said that... Uh, He's pretty sure NASA will pull out the ExoMars mission. Um, of course, this is all ahead of the budget, so we don't really know. Um, but it's not looking very good because they're actually looking to partner up with Russia now for a Mars mission to help, you know, the, the ExoMars mission. But I'd argue that, you know, the, <laughs> the luck of uh, the Russians with, with Mars isn't that great. So I don't know whether that's really going to be a reality or not. So it's, it's very actually... much in the balance. And if I understand things correctly, the um, NASA Europe partnership on ExoMars is something that NASA would really like to do, but because it's an international par partnership, um, they depend on direction from the executive branch to be able yeah. to go forward with that. And NASA has been waiting and begging and hoping to get the directive from the other, br from you know, the executive, in order to get this going, and they never received it. So they're basically left having made all these promises to Europe that they're not going to be able to fulfill. Um, and the other thing to be mentioned about ExoMars is that it's a mission whose launch date has pretty much always been the same number of years in the future ever since they first started proposing it. So yeah. it's it's had a lot of problems, and um, it's it, like Phobos Grunt. It's a it's a mission where ev all kinds of different people have a stake. They like there's there's like a dozen different instruments and, and you just can't imagine a rover the size of the Mars Exploration Rovers with their teeny little science package being able to carry this huge science package down to Mars. So there's a lot of other problems in the program besides NASA pulling out funding, but you know, NASA not giving the billion dollars that they promised to this mission is definitely one of their bigger problems. Yeah, we, we need to be very careful um, in the United States with not annoying ESA. Um, we, we historically have gotten ourselves into trouble by planning joint missions and then at the last minute saying, nope, not going to do it, and leaving them with, with all the money spent on their side. Um, we had started to repair those um, problems with, with recent missions, but as our funding crisis continues, we're in danger of, of again, ruining this wonderful collaboration. Cassini actually was a mission that almost got canceled, but because of the Huygens yeah. uh, lander, the, the probe that was bolted to it, there was a huge amount of international pressure um, to get that thing going, and, and mm -hmm. luckily it was saved. Yeah. Wow. All right, well, I think we're running out of time this week, so I think we should probably wrap it up. So once again, I want to thank everybody who, who is watching us today. Uh, if you haven't already, please plus one the stream in, in Google+. Plus. Uh, and again, thank you to all of the uh, participants. Thanks to Alan, Emily, Ian, Nancy, and Pamela this week uh, for joining us. And we will see you all next week at the same time at the same places. So we'll see you all later. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye.